My name is Marina Sivella and I'm a researcher at the research institute called CRESA in Barcelona and I'm a researcher um, working on swine respiratory diseases, uh, mainly mycoplasma high pneumonia but also uh, working on porcine circovirus type 2. And my presentation dealt with the strain diversity on mycoplasma high pneumonia and its impact on the field. I've summarized all the current knowledge on uh, this strain variability and it's important in terms of diagnostic diagnosis but also on the prevention and control of the disease because as we know there exists some difference of uh, strain virulence but we are not still able to classify such a strain so we have to take into account such variability to take measures to prevent the disease. Okay, so thank you very much Roman for this nice introduction. Um, and thank you also for uh, Siva for inviting me to this such nice event and to such beautiful city that it's my first time in Prague and I hope that to have time to visit the city during these days. Okay, so as Roman mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about the relevance of mycoplasma strain diversity and its impact on the field. As probably you know, uh, at field level, we can face with different situations in regards of mycoplasma high pneumonia infection. Uh, we can find farms in which the, inf the percentage of infected pigs uh, begins, begins at the early stages of production cycle and this percentage is increasing over the time until reaching a moment in which the animals will show the typical dry non-productive cough attributable to mycoplasma and finally the animals will show the typical mycoplasma-like lesions, craniventral pulmonary consolidations, okay? But not pathognomonic of mycoplasma, okay? But we can also find uh, some different scenario in which the infection of mycoplasma t can take place in a farm, but this percentage of infected pigs remains low, okay? And no appearance of clinical signs occurrence and the animals will do not show the lung lesions. So which are the factors that contribute to this such different uh, scenario? There are many of them. There are many factors that will uh, influence on the different infection and seroconversion dynamics that in consequence will also affect the different severity and frequency of lung lesions. We will talk about some of them. The first one, and as not only in mycoplasma, all, uh, in probably all the diseases, the management practices will affect the severity and frequency of clinical signs and lung lesions. As you know, continuous flow and mixing origins will be triggering factors of such respiratory disease. In the same manner, the housing conditions will be also an important point to, to, to be taken into account because high peak density or high ammonia level will contribute to a, a worsen this scenario. At the same time, all of you know that those animals reared during winter conditions will show probably higher probabilities to develop a respiratory disease compared to those reared in summer conditions. And in the same manner, the presence of other pathogens, as for example PRS or Pasturella multocida, mm, Mycoplasma urinis, uh, Mophilus parasus, will, um, will uh, trigger the presence of other um, clinical signs in, in uh, appearing when the porcine respiratory disease complex uh, occurs. But nowadays, uh, there is another factor that is gaining more importance and uh, we call the existence of different mycoplasma strains. So in this presentation, I will explain you the current knowledge about this topic, what we know and what we don't know about this topic. But first of all, and in order to make the presentation a little bit uh, easier, let me explain you how we can know if a strain that we has been isolated in our samples is different from the strain isolated in another one, how we can measure these differences. Nowadays, there are different molecular techniques that would allow us to differentiate between these strains. All these techniques uh, are based on the detection of one or more than one DNA targets, okay? All of them are based on PCR amplification and afterwards probably sequencing of different DNA targets. All of them have different and difficult 
nouns to be pronouns. And don't worry because I'm not going to explain you all these techniques. Just to mention you that you have different options to know how the results should be interpreted. In this table, there are the main characteristics that this technique should accomplish. I'm not also uh, going to explain you in detail all these techniques, I, all these characteristics, but just to let you know that these techniques should accomplish this criteria. First of all, the technique should be reproducible. This means that a sample tested in one lab should be somehow give the same results as it was tested in another lab, okay? The power of discrimination is the power that the technique has to differentiate between two different isolates, okay? The time required, easy of performance and easy of interpretations will depend, are all of them link, and will depend on how, how many steps are involved in each of these techniques. And finally, and probably one of the most important thing is the economic cost, because all these techniques are based not only in one PCR, but also mm, ap apart from the PCR in all, in all other techniques like sequencing, that implies the economic cost of these techniques is higher. Here you have an example of two different techniques, the left side multilocal sequence typing, and the other one is the sequencing on of only one gene, the P146. I put it these two examples that just to show you how the results should be interpreted. As for example, if I mark this strain that it was isolated, or it came from a sample from Brazil, and this sample in this technique is located in the same cluster at, as the blue ones, okay? The samples coming from farm 11. However, when we move to the other uh, phylogenetic tree, we will see that the sample from Brazil has moved to the bottom of the phylogenetic tree, while the blue ones have moved to, to the top of the phylogenetic tree. Then, as you see, the interpretation of such techniques is not always easy. However, the information that they provide us is really important. Once we know how to interpret these results or how we can detect such differences, let's see which is the situation at field level. What do we know about mycoplasma strain diversity? I'm going to give you the, the information uh, in three levels. At individual level, at herd level, at regional level and also what we found at the slaughterhouse. At individual level, we know that an animal can be infected more with more than one strain, okay, at the same time. Indeed, we can detect different strains in the same sample. We can find more than one strain in the lung, but also we can find different uh, strains in different samples at the same time, okay? We can find one strain at the upper respiratory tract and another one in the lower respiratory tract. In addition, it's, it is known that to be infected with one strain does not prevent to be infected with a variant of such a strain or with a different a strain one. In this, in this study, I'm going to talk about the situation at herd level. I'm mentioning this study because it is a special one because it uh, has provided new information. In this, uh, the objective of such a study was to study the, the, the diversity of the strains in, uh, in three different um, nursery units. In this study, valve samples were taken or um, lung samples from mortality uh, death. Um, in this study, four, valve, four um, genotypes were detected. You here you have, okay? These uh, genotypes are characterized by the number of repetitions of these two genes, P97 and P46, 146, sorry. So the green one means that this uh, strain is characterized by having nine repetitions of P97 and 15 repetitions of protein P146. In these three units, only these four uh, genotypes were detected. But if you take a look, they try to correlate the, mm, the detection of these different genotypes according to the percentage of pigs showing coughing. In green, there are the rooms in which no coughing were observed, in green squares. In brown squares, there are represented the, per the rooms in which a poor four percentage of pigs were coughing. And finally, the blue ones are the ones in which a medium percentage, two percentage of pigs were coughing. 
as you can observe, there are no correlation between the genotype and the percentage of caffeine because we can find, as for example, the green genotype, okay, we can find it in green squares, brown squares, and uh, blue squares, okay? So no correlation was found. However, this study was important because it provides us information on pos possible uh, in situ recombinations and mutations. Here you, you have a diagram showing the frequency of these four genotypes. And if you take a look, the genotype yellow, that it was only found in, RAM, in room uh, B1, it seems that uh, it appears from, um, it's derived from in situ recombinations of the genotypes found in different rooms. Okay, so this is the first evidence that in situ recombinations can happen. And the same for this uh, blue genotype, the 715, that it was located in the room, brown room, this one, next to two rooms in which the green genotype was detected. Okay, so at her level, we know that we can detect different genotypes without, at least in this study, any relationship with presence of clinical signs. There is another study, a really nice one, but this time is a longitudinal study in which mycoplasma strain diversity was uh, investigated in three different herds and BALF samples were taken in the same animals at different sampling points. In this study, uh, only one strain per herd was detected, but in farm number one and number four, different variants of the same uh, strain was detected. If we take a look on, this, uh, on, on farm number one, which was the one showing more number of variants of the genotype, was the farm showing the highest lung lesions. The conclusion of this study was that a low degree of heterogeneity between mycoplasma strains was detected. However, these results was in contradiction with other uh, studies published in these regards, as for example, this one. This is a bigger study, epidemiological study, in which 109 herds were tested. These herds were uh, classified in two categories, depending on the presence of, anim of coughing animals. Those farms with coughing animals were considered case herds, while the other were considered as control herds. In this study, up to eight isolates were detected per herd and more than one strain uh, per animal. Okay? If, if I'm not wrong, there were detected three, three uh, strains in one animal. So the conclusion of this study was that the heterogeneity was high. But for me, the most important information that this type of uh, studies would um, allow us to know is whether there is any difference between the strain detected in the coughing herds or the case herds versus the control herds. Unfortunately, no information uh, on these regards is given. The, the authors are not mentioning whether the strains are different. Maybe this is because they didn't find any difference between them. Okay? Another question that arises from this study is whether the, the, the animals harboring more than one strain will show higher or more severe lung lesions. Let's see which kind of information do we have on this respect. Here I, I, I'm showing you two different studies with more or less the same objective, to show or to, to study, to investigate which strains are found at the slaughterhouse level. In the first study, it was done in Canada in 2014, and they tested 168 lungs showing anxiety pneumonia-like lesions from 48 hertz. And in the other one, it was a different uh, scenario. They took samples, valve samples, from three different batches of 10 vaccinated hertz. And in these two uh, studies, the same technique use was used. In the first study, the conclusions of the, the author was that number of uh, strains per lung were not linked with a more severe lung lesions, while the conclusions of the other study was that the higher the number of the strains, the higher prevalence of severity of lung lesions. So, as you can see, the question is still not answered. Let's see what happens at country or regional level. In this study, um, they 
try to genotype strains coming from different places, from different countries, Switzerland, France, Canada, Australia, and Brazil. In this study, I'm, I'm marking you those strains coming from the same multi-site operation, okay? And you can see that they were quite close in the phylogenetic tree. So the results of this study said that identical strains uh, were found in close geographical or contact operations. But as um, as in my presentation, I'm going uh, more, um, forward uh, and backwards in the studies. Here you have another uh, two studies in which they try to generate the strains coming from completely different countries. And in this case, they found uh, strains coming from different places quite close in the phylogenetic tree. So they said that no geographic relation between the strains was found. So, as you see, there are many questions still um, unsolved in regards of uh, the existence of mycoplasma strain variability. Indeed, we still don't know if the outbreak is caused by only one specific strain or if it is caused by the uh, presence of different uh, strains. Uh, um, in addition, we don't know if all the strains found in an, an animal are contributing to such lesions. Are all of them able to be attached to the ciliary tepal cells, or is only the main one that will be attached that will be cause such lung lesions? Now that we know uh, which is the situation at field level, and we know uh, that there are still um, lots of questions to be answered, let's see which would be the implications of such variability. First of all, and in order to know the implication of such variability, we should know whether there exist differences between virulence between these strains, because we, uh, I've demonstrated you that there are different strains at field level, but these strains are different in virulence. This question has been only uh, answer at experimental level. In this uh, study, what the authors uh, did was to select different uh, strains isolated from lungs showing anxiotic pneumonia-like lesions with different um, degree of lesions, okay? And they used these uh, strains to inoculate, experimentally inoculate animals. From the results obtained, uh, they saw that they could detect different levels of respiratory disease. Indeed, in this graphic, you can observe that uh, there were animals showing a high respiratory disease. The strain used in this case, it was classified as highly virulent. On the other hand, they found two animals that show moderate respiratory disease score. So this strain used for inoculating these animals were classified as moderate. And finally, there were three animals that almost did not show any cl clinical signs, although they had been inoculated with mycoplasma. So consequently, these uh, strains were considered low virulent strain. So, do differences on virulence between strains exist? Yes, they do. Another uh, a study that corroborates these uh, results is, a, is an oral communication that will be presented in the Congress that will start tomorrow, and in, uh, with the object did to know uh, which are the variables that affect the most in the reproduction of lung lesions attributable to mycoplasma pneumonia. Indeed, we, m we made a statistical analysis, we compared all the experimental inoculations published so far, and we find that the strain is one of the most important parameters to reproduce the disease. So the, the virulence of the strain is really important. But how can I know if the isolate of mycoplasma that has been detected in my samples, in my animals, is of high, highly virulent, moderate virulent, or low virulent. Again, these, these type of uh, studies have been only done at experimental level, and in this case, what the authors did was to try to genotype these strains by, by one of such techniques that I mentioned above, and they found that uh, the highly and moderately low strains showed a pattern, I don't know if I'm doing with the left hand and I'm right-handed, okay, the highly and moderately show a 5,000 base per band that uh, was not present in the low virulence strain. So the author were really happy and said, okay, we have found a virulence marker for mycoplasma strains. However, 
other groups uh, of research try to find these um, 5,000 base pairs in lots of field uh, isolates and they were not able to find it. Okay, so um, well, this virulence market would be really nice to exist, but not the, it was not found, found in 52 field isolates. On the contrary, this 5,000 base pair, it was found in a stray J. A strain J is the one that most of the commercial vaccines is based and is non-pathogenic. Therefore, the virulence marker, uh, it was not such a virulence marker. However, in another study that I was mentioning before, the authors mentioned that uh, they associate the lack of detection of one specific gene with a, a less pronounced and zootic pneumonia or CBPC lung lesions at a slaughterhouse, okay? But this has, at, at la, as far as I know, nobody else has tested uh, the, the existence of such lothi. So, does a, does a virulence marker exist? Probably yes, but we're still not found. Indeed, we would be really happy to, to find it, but it's still not found. So, which are the main differences among the strains? In red, you have marked the high virulence, high virulence strains, and in blue, the so-called low virulence strains. These differences are related with the intrinsic characteristics. Uh, in mycoplasma pathogenesis, the first step of its pathogenesis, the addition to the uh, ciliated epithelial cells. So it was speculated that the high virulence strains would have more capabilities to add to such cells. But uh, unexpectedly, no significant differences on the addition to the isolated cells was found. On the contrary, it was seen that the high virulence strains ha uh, showed higher expressions of proteins related to the addition and the colonization, whereas the low virulence strains showed high expressions of proteins related to metabolism and growth. Okay? It seems that the low virulence are much more well adapted to the growth in vitro. This would explain the high multiplication rates of the high virulence uh, strains that show higher multiplication rates compared to the lower ones. And finally, um, all of us thought that mycoplasma was an strict respiratory pathogen. However, in the last years, there are a couple of papers in which they detected mycoplasma in other uh, organs apart from lung, as for example, a spleen or a uh, liver without any kind of lesion, but DNA was detected and isolated. These uh, strains were considered high pathogenic ones, okay? And another question that it's somehow unexpected is that one should expect that the higher virulence ones should show higher transmission rates, but in the very few papers uh, talking with this issue, no significant difference has been found. I'm putting this uh, graphic here ju uh, just to mention that in the Congress we, we are going to present a study in which we have evaluated, evaluated the growth dynamic of three different mycoplasma high pneumonia strains. The strain J, that as I mentioned was non-pathogenic, compared to the strain 11 and 2 c that they are considered pathogenic. And you can observe that the growth curve is more or less similar, but the strain J uh, is, um, is reaching the, log the stationary phase of the growth more rapidly and is uh, decreasing even also mm, quite fast compared to the other ones. So the growth dynamics between the strains seems to be different. And with this slide, I'm trying to mention that um, there's plenty of uh, things to learn about mycoplasma uh, strains related with the virulence and the growth dynamics. Which of the differences can we expect in terms of clinical outbreak? Um, what, how can these strains affect the clinical outbreak at farm level? The high virulence strains will evoke uh, early clinical signs, appearance and a severe coughing compared to the low virulence strains. In consequence, the lesions observed from uh, derived from a high virulence strains will be more severe and a higher number of animals will be affected. The seroconversion will also be affected by this different virulence because animals infected with high virulence strains will seroconvert earlier than the ones infected with lower virulence ones. 
And the same happens with the productive parameters. The ones in a farm in which the highly virulent strain is present, probably the average daily weight gain will be reduced uh, compared to the ones uh, caused by the low virulence strain, in which probably no effect on the productive parameters will be seen. And finally, the high virulence strains seem to have higher numbers of pro-inflammatory cytokines and higher infiltration uh, of in inflammatory cells. One of, for, in my opinion, one of the most important implications of such as, uh, variability is the diagnosis, the diagnostic. Here we have a table uh, with a list of uh, PCR techniques. All these A, B, C, D are different PCR techniques described to detect mycoplasma high pneumonia. Okay? And here you have a list of uh, strains uh, tested with all these uh, techniques. I've marked, well, maybe the line is not the correct one, but I've marked those strains that are not detected with some of these PR, PCRs, okay? So the main implication of such a strain variability is that not all the PCRs are detecting all the strains. And the problem with mycoplasma is that every laboratory is using a different PCR. There is no PCR of reference, okay? So one can have different results depending on the laboratory. In parallel, we can have the same problem in regards of seroconversion, okay? As I mentioned to you previously, uh, those uh, animals infected with a high virulence uh, strain will seroconvert earlier than the ones infected with low virulence strains. So, meaning that sending a sample to a lab that, and they say that it's a seronegative animal, probably yes, but maybe depending on the infection dynamics is due to that the virulence causing the infection is of low virulence. Another implication of such a strain variability is in, the, in terms of prevention and control. And for example, antibiotic treatment. In this table, I've summarized four different uh, studies in which uh, the susceptibility against uh, different antibiotics was assessed. I'm not going to talk about this uh, topic because I'm not an expert on that, but for me, uh, there are two very important points. In this first study, uh, on a study conducted in Belgium, they found that a specific strains had a mutation in the 23rd uh, sRNA that um, make the strains um, resistant to macrolides and lincomycin. Okay, but not only the, not all the strains, only ones. And in another study they describe that within a farm may coexist different strains with different antimicrobial susceptibility. And finally, let's see the implication of such variability in terms of vaccination. Just to remind you that not all of them, but most of the um, commercial vaccines now, uh, nowadays available on the market are bacterines based on a strain J. This strain was isolated in 1963 and is non-pathogenic. In addition, it has been described that the homology between the field strains and the vaccine strain, at least in this study, was less than a 55%. So the results arise the question whether the different vaccine efficacy that we can find at the field level could be attributable to these differences between vaccine uh, and field strains homology. Here you have a table from another study in which uh, they genotype the strains detected in three different herds, herd A, B, and C, and also they compared the strains detected by means of genotyping four different four or five different lothies with the DNA detected in the bacterines. I don't know which bacterines are, and I don't know how they uh, detect the DNA. I don't know, okay? But what surprised me the most is that if you compare, each letter means a different genotype, okay? And as for example, in P146, you can see that all the strains in the farm was labeled as A, but in the bacterin B, there were three different genotypes, okay? And also, um, for example, in H4, let me put this way now. In H4, you can observe that 
uh, all the strains detected in the farm were labeled as O or P, but in the bacterium it was Q, R, and S. Okay? As I mentioned, I don't know which strain uh, bacteria are, and I don't know how this um, um, study was done, but the information for me is quite interesting. Another question that uh, could be of your interest is whether the vaccine efficacy can be affected by the challenge strain. In this study, and I just uh, would like to mention that it's an experimental one and there's only one study talk on this issue, they wanted to test the vaccine efficacy of a commercial vaccine based on strain J uh, compared to when animals were infected with the high virulence strains compared to the low virulence strains. In this study, they observed lung lesions after four weeks post-infection and eight weeks post-infection, but the highest peak of lesions uh, were observed at four weeks of mm, post-infection. And the vaccine efficacy was higher in those animals infected with the high virulence strains because the difference in compared with the non-vaccinated ones was higher. But the, in both groups, the vaccine was efficacy. Another study in, um, that could be uh, really interesting is to know if the vaccine efficacy is affected by the homology between the vaccination and the challenge. In this study, what they did was to use three different uh, strains isolated in the, in the lab and use it as a bacterins, okay, without any placebo. Okay? And they call it a strain I, A, B, and C. And... Um, two, I don't know, two or three weeks after, they challenged the animals with all of them with the same strain, a strain A. And they compared the results with a group that was vaccinated with a commercial vaccine. As you can observe, results of this study are not uh, probably the expected ones because uh, the vaccination and challenge with the same strain did not improve the vaccine efficacy when compared to the commercial vaccine. Indeed, the results of the commercial vaccine was not probably the best one. So this study is, again, only one, and it was done on experimental conditions. As far as I know, there is uh, no other studies comparing the efficacy using different uh, challenge strains. And finally, I would like to show you uh, briefly the results of one of our PhD students that is doing the PhD at CRESA. And the objective of such a study was to uh, analyze the strain variability of mycoplasma in a Spanish slaughterhouses. But the difference of uh, this study is that we tested vaccinated and non-vaccinated farms. So Laura went to the slaughterhouses and took um, lung samples from uh, three to five animals showing severe lung lesions. Okay? Indeed, um, Laura and her, uh, her, her colleagues um, calculated the batch lung level, the, the whole batch, but also from the three to five animals showing quite nice lesions. And afterwards, we analyzed the strain from these samples, counting again the repetition of such genes, okay? these four genes. As you see, here you have the sequence, and once you have, we have obtained the, the amino acid sequence, we can count the repetitions and we can classify the strains. Here you have the results of the lung lesions, okay, from non-vaccinated herds, 10 non-vaccinated and 10 vaccinated herds, okay? The blue ones are the non-vaccinated and the red ones are the vaccinated. In yellow, we have the mean lung lesion score of the whole batch. And in blue, the mean lung lesion score only of these through three to five animals. And because of that, the mean is higher. Okay? We can observe that, in general, the lung lesions are higher in those non-vaccinated herds. But we can observe two non-vaccinated herds that the, lo the lesion uh, was quite low, and in the vaccinated ones, we can observe also some uh, farms in which the lesions was quite low. But um, what we interested the most is that when we analyze the level of DNA of mycoplasma present in such uh, samples from the three to five animals, we realize that those um, vaccinated farms with really low levels of mycoplasma is because mycoplasma was not able to be detected. Okay? So we could not 
genotype, the samples, because mycoplasma was at really, really low levels and we were not able to detect it. Finally, when we analyzed um, the strains detected in such farms, we observed that we were not able to genotype the, the genes H1 and H4 in all the samples. We don't know why, because we were able to detect it by PCR, but not sequencing them. And indeed, these are preliminary results, and we are trying to improve this. But when we analyzed the P97 and the P146, we observed that we found only one strain per farm, but, um, with the exception of one, one non-vaccinated farm in which we detect three different uh, uh, strains. And indeed, it was the, strain, the farm showing the highest lung lesions. And we also observed that the farms coming, or the animals coming from the same origin, were harboring the same mycoplasma strain, as for example, these three non-vaccinated strains. So finally, and after all this information and all these uh, non-answered questions, I would like to rem remind you that mm, different mycoplasma strains do exist at field level, that within a farm we can uh, detect one or more uh, than one strain per animal, and that this existence may have different implications on severity of the disease, treatment and prevention, and most importantly, on diagnostic. And as probably as have you already seen, a strain molecular typing is not an easy task. So, thank you very much for your attention.